Well, welcome, everyone. I'm Norm Hart, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our college seminar this uh, this afternoon, or yes, I guess we're in the afternoon. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, Dr. John Shun, uh, our speaker today. Uh, John joined us just six months ago uh, from the uh, Pennington Biomedical Research Center, where he did a postdoctoral fellowship in the Walking Behavior Laboratory. Uh, before that, he received his graduate degrees at uh, North Dakota State University, and uh, I understand he's enjoying this weather. <laughs> uh, Not into there. And um, we're really delighted to have John, and he's really uh, brought a, a new research focus to our program, and we're delighted to, to have him speak to us today. So, John, thanks for doing this. Thank you, Norm. Uh, I'm not complaining about the weather. That was <laughs> the same thing. This has been beautiful. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about wearable monitors. So I put this collage together um, just the other day, and this represents simply a fraction of the different devices that are out there that you can wear that might track your physical activity, your sleep, steps, uh, you name it. The question that you may want to or ask yourself is, what do you call these things? And there's a variety of different names. Some might call them wearables, some might call them wearable monitors, some might call them objective monitors. From a research perspective, we typically call them objective monitors. Sometimes we call them wearables more frequently, but from a commercial perspective, when the consumer buys these and puts them on, we call them wearables. I have a couple examples that I'll pass around just for you to see. This is a Nike fuel band, which they are no longer making. So Nike went defunct with this division. Uh, they have paired with Apple for the Apple Watch. I don't actually know what their role in that is going to be, but um, that's what they've done so far. This is a little device called an Active Pal. This is a postural accelerometer. You put it on your thigh, and we can tell whether or not you're sitting down, whether you're standing. This is a Gen Active, which is just a triaxial accelerometer that measures acceleration in three planes, um, and it has a high dynamic range. So that means we can use it for sporting applications, for physical activity, you name it. So I'll start here. Pass them to the right. You're going to have to do some physical activity to get up and pass these around. That's a good thing. All right. With these monitors, I want to briefly go over some of the good, the bad, and the ugly things about them. In terms of good things, they offer objective quantification of a whole bunch of different physiological parameters. Uh, we can measure motion with the accelerometers that are in them. We can measure heart rate telemetry. Uh, we have GPS, so we can measure location in space. Um, also have temperature sensors in some of these devices. The nice thing about these devices is traditionally we weren't able to necessarily measure physical activity objectively in free living. We could measure physical activity perhaps in a lab setting where we collect gases, but not in free living very well. Uh, these allow us to do that. Um, and the main benefit that people often purport is that it eliminates bias from your individual perceptions. So if you were to self-report your physical activity, it may be different than what we get from a device. The bad associated with these devices is that the ultimate outputs that we get from them are very difficult to interpret most of the time. Um, and the consumer devices have done a better job at this. You know, we get steps, we may get activity estimates or calorie estimates. The validity of those is highly questionable. Those devices have not really been tested or evaluated rigorously. And by the time they develop a device and put it on the market, we may have the time to test it. They're already putting another generation of the device on the market with numerous changes. So it's hard to really say one way or another if the device is doing a good job at what it's doing. Um, additionally, if you want to use these sorts of devices, let's say for research purposes, to track physical activity in a large cohort study, the price adds up quite a bit. You're talking $250, $500 per device. Multiply that by a couple hundred or a couple thousand, and the price tag jumps dramatically. In terms of the ugly, um, I talk about the quantified self-movement. How many of you are familiar with this? No one? These are a group of individuals who 
take these wearable monitors to the max. So they put as many of these monitors, the devices on themselves, in the thought that all of this data will make them a better person. There have been some very outlandish claims and uses associated with this movement. So I have a couple of examples. Um, some people basically think that they can collect so much information that they can predict their energy or their life expectancy to the day. Um, others take it even further to predict bowel movements to the minute in the future. Um, and there have even been some research associated with this, not really research, but um, observations by some that eating butter improves arithmetic ability. And this was captured via inputs from these types of devices all over the body. Who has wearables in the audience, if you don't mind my asking? Anyone? Just a couple? Who has their mobile phone? All right, so most mobile phones, most smartphones, are essentially wearable monitors. Typically, they have an accelerometer in them. They may have a gyroscope, GPS capability as well. If this is carried on or with your body, technically, it could be construed as a wearable monitor. But typically, you're not wearing your phone to bed at night, um, but they do have the armband uh, holding uh, patches where you can put the phone in and it acts just like a wearable monitor. You can activate apps that count steps, things like that. I want to make a distinction before we go further about the difference between these types of devices, one being research-grade devices, the other being consumer devices. The first distinction is that these devices really apply to different groups of people. Research devices are used by scientists who conduct physical activity research primarily. The wearables are marketed to everyone, anyone who wants to track physical activity. So for instance, the devices I passed around, the fuel band is a consumer device. The other two, the Fit or the uh, Gen Active and the Active Pal are both research devices. The second kind of main distinction between these two is whether or not they've been evaluated or tested for things like reliability or validity. The consumer devices, there is very little information out there in terms of validity or reliability. We've begun to get a little bit more data on some of the devices. But as I've mentioned, there's been new generations from the same companies that pump out, essentially, the new model of the device. And whether or not our previous validation studies apply anymore is kind of a question mark. The research devices, we do have these sorts of studies to evaluate whether or not they're reliable and valid. And the last distinction is uh, more or less how they're sold. The research grade devices, you buy them directly from the manufacturer. You cannot go to the store and purchase them. Uh, there's really no middlemen. The consumer devices, we can buy them on Amazon, we can go to Target, you name it, you can get these through multiple outlets. So that's a big distinction between these two. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to focus more so on research applications. So research devices similar to the Gen Active, which is shown here, that's what I'm passing around, and then also the Active Pal, are just some of the devices. And particularly, we'll focus on accelerometers and their application in measuring physical activity. Excuse me. So in the past, up until about 15 to 20 years ago, physical activity was almost universally assessed by a self-report. We would give someone a questionnaire, they would have a diary or log, and they would report on their physical activity. Objective methods um, using wearable monitors basically allow us to perhaps eliminate some of the biases that may come out in some of those self-reports. That said, there still is validity and self-report in some respects. A lot of these monitors don't tell you any contextual information about, let's say, if you were sleeping and you had to wake up in the middle of the night, the monitor might show motion. And maybe you got up because you had an upset stomach you would be able to report that via self-report, but the monitor wouldn't be able to really tell you that. So there is still benefits to self-report. Um, but that said, there are definitely some advantages to objective measures. 
First, we're going to look at some of the disagreements between objective and subjective or self-report methods. So this is data collected from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in 2005-2006, where we quantified minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity um, on a weekly basis. We compare the accelerometer measure of 42.8 minutes per week to the questionnaire, 38.87. Huge discrepancy, about a nine-fold difference. We plot the current public health guidelines on their 150 minutes moderate to vigorous intensity physical activity per week. Um, we see that both of them are, well, there's a lot of people probably meeting the self-report guideline, very few meeting the um, objective guideline if we apply that same criteria. Turning these numbers into prevalence estimates for meeting the guidelines from the same survey year we see that less than 10% of people meet the guidelines according to an accelerometer, over 60 meet it according to self-report. So the logical question is, which one is correct? If we think back to epidemiology that underlies physical activity guidelines, that is essentially summarized here, quantity of physical activity on the X, health outcomes on the Y, we see this inverse relationship. The Epidemiological evidence that underpins the guidelines was nearly all from self-report. So it might be inappropriate to use these devices and simply apply their outputs and say whether or not someone is meeting physical activity guidelines. It's a little bit of an apples and oranges approach. I've been guilty of doing this in the past myself. I've, I've done this, uh, quantified physical activity objectively, made a determination whether or not someone was meeting these guidelines of 150 minutes per week. I now don't think that that's the right approach, considering the data was originally all based upon self-report. That said, there's still benefits to using objective measures. One of the first things we can look at is construct validity. So how do these measurements relate to different parameters we would think that they should be theoretically associated with? So if we just do some simple correlations from NHANES, looking at a couple of anthropometric and cardiometabolic parameters related to accelerometer-determined MVPA or self-reported MVPA, we generally see that they're tracking in the same directions, these negative correlations. But you'll notice the objective measures have stronger magnitudes, larger magnitudes. But still, we're not lighting the world on fire necessarily. These aren't huge correlations. Uh, but they're still considerably larger than what we see here. If we compare measures from an accelerometer, whether we're looking at moderate to vigorous physical activity or one of the primary outputs that we get from the device, which would be activity counts, and I'll talk more about what those are, generally we see the same trends. So the strength and magnitude of the correlations are relatively equal between these two. Even if we pull the steps from the accelerometer, we see similar trends as well. Uh, so it really doesn't necessarily matter from a relating to health outcomes perspective which one of these measures we use. The, one of the disadvantages that I need to first talk about is the outputs that we get from these devices. So the primary output is an activity count. And an activity count is somewhat of an ambiguous term. They are good for rank ordering individuals. So we get this output after someone wears it for a week, how many activity counts they maybe got on a daily basis. We can rank order people, all things being equal. Those who got more activity counts did more physical activity. Translating that into minutes and let's say moderate or vigorous intensity is much more difficult. We have to run calibration studies in order to try to make sense of that. And it's an imperfect way to do it, but it's generally one of the most used approach. Uh, First off, though, what exactly is an activity count? If we start with a accelerometer tracing, so this is one second worth of a signal, um, and this is acceleration in Gs. Um, you'll see this is, a, I should mention, this is from an actigraph accelerometer. Those of you who may be familiar with this sort of research, collected at 80 hertz. The first thing we do is we take this raw signal and we digitize it. So we use an analog to digital um, converter and we transform this into bins. So these, uh, I'll explain more what these mean, but 
essentially these are discrete bins that those levels of acceleration correspond to. I'm not showing the full range here. This accelerometer has a plus or minus 6G range. So 6G is in the positive direction, 6G is in the negative. And these bins correspond to 2 to the 11 in the positive or 2 to the 11 in the negative, um, which 4,000, 2,048. Um, anyways, uh, this is only a fraction of the y-axis I'm showing here. Uh, so we take this signal first, like this, and then we filter it to try and pull the noise out. Then we full wave rectify it, which means we just take the absolute value of everything. And then we take the mean value across a user-defined interval, so typically a second. So in this case, we got 93 counts in one second. Now I skipped some of the finer details in how this count was calculated, but that's a general approach that's often used. Uh, some of the finer details, though, are proprietary. The companies that make these devices they hold them as trade secrets. They do not publish this um, for fear that it hurts their bottom line. Um, in general, though, this is kind of an approach that's used. Once we have those activity counts, let's say on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, the data may look something like this. Uh, we can imagine that this is a spreadsheet, minutes 1 through 14, just a clip here, with activity count values in the corresponding column. We then take cut point ranges from calibration studies that correspond to different intensities of activity and apply them back to the values of counts that we have. So we simply iterate over each minute. We say it's sedentary, light, moderate, vigorous, et cetera. We add them up over the entire day, and then we might average across days, um, depending upon what exactly our goal is with the uh, assessment we did and what we might be doing from an analysis standpoint. In terms of disadvantages associated with these counts, as I mentioned, they're proprietary. So the exact methods are secretive. The companies usually don't say, um, at least for the majority of research grade devices. And there's a couple of other distinctions or differences that might influence the data we get. Uh, we have different analog to digital converters, whether it's an 8-bit or 12-bit converter, different dynamic ranges of the accelerometers, 2, 6, 8G ranges. And then the biggest one is probably different filter parameters. So digital filtering or filtering in general of a signal is not non-trivial. It's kind of difficult. There's a lot of moving components, and mathematically it can be very complex. Uh, the companies like it that way so then they can keep it secretive. Um, but because of this, the outputs we get across devices, at least from a research setting, are not comparable at all. So another common physical activity monitor besides the Actigraph is the Actical, and it also outputs count values, and if I got 500 counts in one device and 500 counts in another device, they're not comparable. They are completely different. The advantages, though, of some of these monitors getting away from counts is we can wear them in multiple places to track physical activity. We can put them on your waist, we can put them on your wrist, which has become more popular, particularly from a compliance or ease of wear standpoint, although that hasn't been shown empirically. It's believed that it's easier to comply to protocols, wear it longer with it on the wrist. Additionally, we can use it to assess people who may have disabilities. So we can put it in different locations on the body to track physical activity, um, which is definitely a benefit. The downfall, though, is you have to realize these devices were primarily validated and developed for use with a placement on or near the waist, basically on the hip. So the methods that we use to process the data don't necessarily translate. If I use methods I would traditionally use to process data on a waste accelerometer to data collected from the wrist, you're going to get different information that might not be very informative. That said, the wrist has become a popular attachment site, uh, most notably because the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey beginning in the 11 and 12 cycles reinstituted the physical activity assessment component with an accelerometer. They chose a wrist placement. This was done essentially out of uh, 
right word, Rick Troiano, who is the, the head of this at National Cancer Institute, really got thrown under the bus by NCHS. He's the guy who oversaw the development of the first protocol when they measured physical activity by accelerometer in 2003 to 2006. They had to throw out about a third of the data when they actually analyzed it at the end because it didn't meet compliance requirements. Basically, people didn't wear it enough. So he was really forced to think about how do we improve compliance. So it was thought that wearing it on the wrist would automatically make it easier and we would have more compliance. It was not an informed decision from science at all, um, unfortunately. And they're paying the price right now. They finished the 2012 or 2013-14 cycle, and we have no idea when the data would even be available. Um, at the earliest six months to a year, and it would be in very limited format at that point. Um, that said, uh, that's what we're stuck with at this point. And it would have made perhaps more sense to stick with the hip attachment, which is normally where it would have been in terms of translating this data into something meaningful. To kind of show you how this works, we can take a look at the Actigraph device. This is some uh, research we published in Medicine, Science, and Sports and Exercise a couple months back. And compare directly observed stepping rate or cadence while people are uh, ambulating on a treadmill measured by an Actigraph which is placed on the waist versus measured by one placed on the wrist. We see that at the low speeds, 1.5 miles per hour, uh, we see fairly good agreement between the actigraph and direct observation, uh, about a 10% underestimation or so with the actigraph placed on the wrist. As we go up in speed, so down in this graph, we see a bigger discrepancy between these where at 7 miles an hour, they were running at a cadence of 171 and a half steps per minute on average. The wrist placement site was only giving us 86 and a half steps per minute, where the waist was giving us 172 and a half. So it's nearly identical, very similar between these two. On this side, um, we see that there's a large discrepancy, which just gets bigger as speed increases. Um, so the methods that are currently implemented in some of these devices, they weren't necessarily developed for these wrist pla placements. Uh, despite that, that hasn't stopped people from doing it. Another advantage of these wearable monitors is the data resolution that we get from them. So now with the modern storage capacities that we're able to attain, uh, we can store vast quantities of data on the devices themselves. So half gigabyte, gigabyte, two gigabytes, four gigabytes worth of data. Uh, we can collect samples um, 100 times per second and store data for an entire week or more. Um, we can then use that sort of resolution potentially to not just quantify overall physical activity, but actually identify physical activity types. So we can use ma machine or statistical learning methods to take this data and try to basically identify the activity with the hope that if we know what the activity is, and we can see kind of a marker of the intensity, we'll get a better prediction of energy expenditure than if we just knew the marker of intensity. Uh, this has really been the golden goose that a lot of people have chased for the last six or seven years. There's been a, a lot of NIH dollars that has gone into this. Unfortunately, the methods have proven somewhat cumbersome and the external validity of a lot of these methods has been very poor. So they've developed these um, machine learning systems on a given sample, they try to validate it on an external sample and it completely falls apart. It's not really worth a whole lot, um, unfortunately. But that's not to say that there isn't still potential in this area. Disadvantages though, all that resolution, data resolution, um, creates a problem from a storage standpoint. Uh, this is a, really a big data application when you think about it. We can take uh, looking at a week's worth of data for a single individual. Uh, I, I kind of made up some of these numbers, like self-report. This would be a small, comma-separated flat file or CSV. Might be about uh, 3,000 <coughs> bytes, so three kilobytes. And some of that is just the, the basic um, framework of the file itself, so that's not all data, just very minimal amount of data. But as we increase going from minute by minute to second by second to 30 hertz, 
50 hertz, 100 hertz. Um, we see this large jump in data size. A single flat file that contains data from a triaxial accelerometer assessing individuals for about a week is usually around one to one and a half gigabytes in size. We can compress that to about a third of that size fairly easily, um, but still it's a lot of data. One of the best examples of this is the women's health study that uh, Iman Lee is one of the co-PIs on at Harvard. And uh, she's actually talked about this in a couple presentations. They implemented an accelerometer assessment beginning two years ago um, where they were doing mail outs of these accelerometers. And in the end, they were going to assess or get data from approximately 18,000 women they had anticipated. The total amount of memory was 20 terabytes storage, I should say, um, associated with that data. That's quite a bit. Um, that uh, makes it difficult from an infrastructure standpoint. You have to have the IT ability to be able to handle that sort of data. And some places are simply not, basically don't have that capability uh, to start with. Uh, when you're actually working with this data, if you're processing raw data, it can be extremely frustrating. Uh, one of the issues is uh, essentially program or computer crashes that you run into quite often. And a single file from a week's worth of raw data is non-trivial to process. You're talking um, 1.4, 1.5 gigabytes. Depending what programs you use, some of them read everything into memory to begin with. And your disk starts to thrash, and the program will say something like, cannot allocate vector of size blank. Or you might get memory error or insufficient memory. In terms of future applications for these types of devices, in terms of research-grade devices, I mentioned how the proprietariness of the field in terms of the different companies that produce devices um, has somewhat been a hindrance to the, the development of the science in the area. We've known what the physical components of the devices were. We didn't know really what some of the things in the background were, what was going on with the data that were, they were ultimately collected. Related to this, the data processing methods that much of these companies have employed, you know, they basically say, we carefully chose to use blank and blank with no rationale. So there's no real science behind it in terms of uh, being able to critique whether or not what they chose was appropriate. And increased Transparency in this area would help quite a lot. We are seeing a push in that direction with the devices now storing raw data so people can work with the raw data and essentially create the outputs that they want. However, that's not very easy. A lot of people want to use the software that the company gives you. You can plug in an actigraph, download the data, um, and you're done. It becomes much more difficult when you're working with raw data for a large sample of people collected over seven days for each one. You get huge volumes of data, and you may not know how to process that. In terms of other applications, I want to talk about the Actigraph accelerometer specifically. This is the most widely used research-grade accelerometer. Uh, I've used it, I can't count how many times in studies. I've used it. I know a lot of other faculty have them and use them. Um, the main issue with them, from my standpoint, is that their activity counts that they calculate are proprietary. We don't necessarily know what's going on. They've divulged some information about them. We know that they take the raw signal and they pass it through what's called a digital bandpass filter uh, with corner frequencies of 0.25 and 2.5 hertz. So a bandpass filter is kind of shown here. Uh, we can think of it as a mathematical model such that we can filter the signal by passing the components of the acceleration signal that <coughs> fall within those frequency bands, so between these two bounds, and attenuating the components of the signal that fall outside of those bands. However, there are some undesirable consequences of this 2.5 uh, hertz cutoff that they use. And specifically, we call it the plateau phenomenon. 
So I can show this visually if we look at the actigraph activity counts per minute. We can plot that across ambulation speed, going from 0.5 to 9, I think this was 9 miles per hour. You can see as we get up to 6 and go beyond, counts actually decline. That doesn't necessarily make sense. There should be um, an increase there. If we plot VO2 on this from METs collected simultaneously, we still see that O2 consumption was increasing during this time. So we had increasing VO2 yet decreasing activity counts at the higher end. Um, that's kind of an undesirable effect of the device. We would like to see more of a linear relationship with VO2 since this is supposed to try to be some sort of proxy for energy expenditure. Um, what's going on here is that as we go from slower speeds to higher speeds, a larger component of the power in the signal basically comes out to the higher frequencies. And if we look in the bandpass filter specifically, we see more power within these frequencies here than we see here. So this is what's driving this, this roll off. Yeah? When you have the data from comparing the risk to the um, waste from your study mm -hmm. from last year, you can see that there was far less differentiation as the speeds increased uh, for the risk one, even though the numbers were lower than the, the waste one. You know, in other words, that plateau was evident pretty early. And I suspect because they're lower numbers, it's not this phenomenon, but it, it was something that was apparent just looking at your table that there was very little differentiation from the counts on the risk once you got past a certain speed and went to higher speeds. Oh, they didn't change much. Yeah, the numbers were pretty much the same. I think that that might be more a, a function of the, the arm swing it, it may be relatively similar. Um, I don't know yet. That, to, to be honest, I haven't thought about it that way, but no, I'll have to think about that. But, but Ectical has a lot more high threshold than Ectigraph. So if you replicated that study with Ectical, actually that can be answering what uh, Tony's question. Yeah. That's a, you know, one has a two point, I think Ectical has a six megahertz or six hertz cutoff point or something like that. So it, it will actually have a answer to what Tony's question can be answered. Is that really due to their artifact of a cutoff score or is yeah. it due to their the actual motion of behavior? Yeah. Actually, I have the data to be able to look at that. I just don't have. <laughs> that's not something we've looked at. Yeah. John, but, but, and I'm not sure. I'm just thinking, would this be partially explained by just so the range of motion of my arm joint, so my joint, versus my stride and length. How is that? How would that play into these different counts that you're coming across with this notion of maybe there's just the, in terms of motion of my arm, there's just limited range of motion relative to altering my stride length from a walk to a, a sprint in that stride length of that. So I think that that was what I was perhaps going to use as a somewhat of a pseudo explanation that might be accounting for some of that, but it was. It's hard to tell. We'd actually have to look at the data that we have to see whether or not that's occurring. This is all waste data, though, that I'm showing here. So this is not collected from the wrist. Uh, but we see this general plateau pattern pretty consistently with this device. And it goes back. Not This is with uh, this was collected with the GT3X Plus, which is two generations removed from the newest device that they have. It goes all the way back to the first device that they developed, the um, AM7164. Has the same had the same issue as this. Good question. Uh, one more. Yeah. To, to Henry Montoya, so his original sort of <coughs> work. Does that get any clue to the proprietary nature of sort of where these have evolved to? Like, so looking at fundamental work that was done around developing formulas, or is it just so much the technology is so different now that it doesn't? Really It is different. Um, the modern devices are capacitive accelerometers. Um, 
as opposed to some of the piezoelectric designs that were done in the past. I mean, they try to translate some of that stuff. Um, but there, there definitely is differences. I mean, the, the idea is, is they've tried to make their outputs consistent. At least that's what they say. So that the output that you get from the latest generation of the device matches the first outputs that came with their first device that they developed since a lot of the calibration studies were done on those devices. Empirically, we know that that's not necessarily the case. Um, they're close, you know, the outputs are often close, but they're not the same. And some of the stuff like steps have changed device to device. There's been a lot of variability in the measures we get related to that, how they extract steps. All right, so getting back about talking about uh, the accelerometers, some of the shortfalls associated with the proprietary, proprietary natures of these devices can be overcome with the open source data that we now have. So we do have the so-called raw data stored on the devices. Um, and we can actually now look and see whether or not uh, the choices, let's say, for the bandpass filter make sense. Are we actually capturing true movement and screening out all the noise that we shouldn't or don't want in the signal? or or could we do better? Um, and that's a question that really hasn't been answered empirically yet. Um, to show you an example of this, we can look at data collected concurrently from two devices at the same location. So I passed around the Gen Active earlier. You can actually use this as a waste-worn accelerometer. So they have a waste belt that goes with it. You just need to pop off the, um, the wrist strap, and you can use it as a waste-worn accelerometer. Uh, the way in which we calculate minutes of, let's say, moderate to vigorous physical activity is a little bit different in the actigraph. I won't go into quite a lot of detail about it. But ultimately, the results we get in terms of time and given intensities are different. Right? Different methods, different numbers. So we see almost twice as much time in MVPA using the Gen Active versus a actigraph. This is in a sample of children. Why not use the raw data that we have available on these devices now. Despite some of the differences in the devices, um, they both have three axes. Um, the dynamic range is a little bit different. We can adjust the sampling frequencies differently. Um, there is a fair amount of similarity, though, in terms of the data structure that we ultimately get from it. Um, cost is comparable. If we, alternatively, what I've been looking at is a different way of summarizing this data. So it's similar to how we would summarize activity counts, but instead of converting this into bins, where we uh, basically have these digitized bins corresponding uh, to 2 to the 11 positive, 2 to the 11 in the negative, for a 12-bit converter, we simply stick with the G values that we have from both devices. So this is uh, data I'm going to show is from two devices that were taped on top of each other. Um, worn in a sample. We collected this data uh, a year and a half ago during my postdoc. We filter this data, we rectify it, and then we get this value of 2.66 G across a second. That's a mean value. Um, I don't really know what we want to call this at this point. If we start adding these up, the interpretation becomes less intuitive. So I'm going to call this G counts for our purposes. I'll worry about the name later. Um, but we could do this for a second, add this up over a minute period, and this is actually what I've done. So we collect data simultaneously using the Gen Active and Actigraph, and then we process both of them with a fourth order Butterworth filter with corner frequencies of 0.25 and 3.5 hertz. So I just opened up the top corner a little bit. The filter had to be specified a bit differently in the digital domain because the sampling rates are different. Um, that said, the results we get are highly similar in the end. And then we summarize the data using the same approach that I just showed. And some of the values that we get for a single participant, 195 minutes worth of wear. We get the sum of these G counts over that time, 660.7 versus 665.3, pretty close. The mean values. Um, over that entire time are essentially identical. The correlations are nearly perfect. I broke with tradition and decided not to do a Bland-Altman plot. I've seen way too many recently, 
and uh, didn't feel like doing it for a method comparison. So I just plotted the line of identity um, and did basically predicted ActiGraph, these G counts per minute by gen active G counts per minute. The line of identity or Y equals X is the dash line. You can't see it all that well because the fitted regression line for this lies essentially right on top of it. We see most of the points are essentially right on the line. And then if we summarize them and compare them, let's see, to the active graph values, obviously we get much different values. The counts are going to be way different. But the correlations are still this pretty high. Now we can take a look at this plateau phenomenon again. But let's plot these G counts data against it. And we don't see this decline, but we see a little bit better relationship here. So we're not decreasing in values with increasing um, O2 consumption. Now this is still very preliminary at this point. There's much we can do to perhaps improve this. And a lot of research needs to go from an exploratory standpoint in this area. But it's certainly something that uh, has a little bit, a lot of potential, at least in my mind. We can then calibrate this data. Um, if we have gases, we can do kind of traditional calibration studies. If you want to use cut point approaches, we could feed this into machine learning type systems to try to take one of those approaches. Or there's the potential that we may even be able to back calibrate against existing cut points developed for count values. So if we take the ActiGraph data, for instance, and we take data from a single participant and try to find an optimal threshold using rock curves that discriminates uh, between moderate intensity in adults, so 2020 is kind of a common threshold in adults with the ActiGraph, 3.473 G counts per minute, and we see a nearly perfect discrimination. And when we apply this to another sample, in terms of time and moderate to vigorous physical activity, we get pretty comparable results across the board between the different devices and then also compared to actigraph counts. Um, so this is something that you know, has potential going forward. This has been a big issue. If I have one device, I need to have calibration studies or use data from calibration studies in the past to inform exactly what I'm doing. And it has to be specific to that device. This opens the door for potentially being able to compare data from different devices. So the non-proprietary methods that I've you know, kind of just talked about um, can achieve some similar outcomes, not just for MVPA, but also for time and sedentary or light physical activity as well. And we can apply these to data that's even collected at different sampling rates, whether or not it's at 50 or 100 hertz. The larger the discrepancy or difference in sampling rates, though, the more difficult it's going to be to match the data. Um, that said, from some of the stuff we've done, we've gotten pretty similar results comparing data that was collected at 30 hertz to data that was collected at 100 hertz simultaneously. Um, you go much below that, though, and the results tend to diverge a bit. Uh, the big thing that resonates in my mind is that this sort of approach opens up the door for comparing outputs across devices. Uh, you have to take into account some of the differences on a fundamental level, whether or not there's a difference in the dynamic range of the device or not. Um, but we may be able to overcome even some of those things to get some pretty good data out of these. There have been some similar methods developed by some colleagues of mine, one in particular um, Alex Rollins, who's at University of South Australia, has done some rather similar stuff to what I'm doing here. And uh, if you read any of Alex's work, um, it's uh, certainly, I like it, it's enlightening. Uh, it hasn't necessarily caught on, though, unfortunately. Um, and I'll talk about why I think that is. But uh, I think it needs to. But still, these methods need substantial further evaluation and calibration to see whether or not um, the ultimate parameters we agree upon are correct. And the push here is to develop evidence-based methods to process these data and not simply rely on what the company gives us. Ultimately, the idea would be to package all of this into some sort of GUI or graphical user interface that the end user could use. Because I may be talking about these different filtering methods, and it, it may sound like I'm talking hieroglyphics. Um, so it has to be 
something that an end user can use and actually get meaningful outputs with. Um, and to do that, uh, it's a lot of legwork to, to put together a package like that. First, and a lot of the work we're doing, is trying to identify the best approaches to process this data. We're doing a lot of work in high-level languages, Python, MATLAB, R. Eventually, though, if we wanted to really put the application out there for people to use, on a large scale basis, you would have to do a lot of this coding in uh, more procedural type languages, C, C++, Fortran, because the computational speed will matter when you're trying to process data from 100, 200, 300 people, and it's raw data collected at, let's say, 100 hertz over a week. That's, you know, if you don't want to wait, wait a day or two for the computer to be able to work on something like that, um, you'd like to have it fast. And these sorts of programming languages would allow that. There's a lot more upfront work, though, in doing that programming. In terms of acknowledgments, I'd like to give a shout out to some of my former colleagues at the Pennington Biomedical Research Center, um, Syracuse University, Helen DeVos Children's Hospital here at OSU, most notably the WAVE team, um, Alex Rollins at University of South Australia, and uh, my friend Nick Baylor, who's at Mathematica Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. References? Any questions? Is the gene activity measured by risk or by health? Is what? The, the, the gene active. Are there measure today measure hip or? It can do both. The data I presented was all in the hip. Yeah. So you're it's, trying it's primarily marketed as a wrist device, though. Does its software or its um, you know, outputs, like you're saying, um, was it validated for waste or wrist? Which one? The Gen X Gen Active. It has validation studies for both. For both. So you can, like, Whatever software they use, you can sort of select that. Yeah, so they, they actually have some functionality in their software. And they are, I didn't mention this, but GenActive is a, um, they were built as like a startup company. I don't know the mechanism in the UK, but they're uh, based out of London. And uh, they are completely open source. So everything in terms of the technology inside the device, the methods that they offer to process it, the outputs you get, they, they give you all that information. Some of it's very technical and kind of difficult to sift through, but they give you all the information that is occurring. Yeah. So um, I was really taken by the, the slide where you showed the, the NHANES data, the, the self-report versus the mm -hmm. kind of objective monitoring data. And I was wondering, in NHANES data, how exactly is the self-report um, information garnered? Because we know from other domains of health-related research and, and such that kind of the the aggregation of states of momentary assessments does not always correlate very highly with a person's kind of global retrospective report. So I was just kind of curious. You know, I can imagine when you're dealing with the volume and intensity of the assessments of the data you get out of these accelerometer technologies that you could actually play around with numbers and depending on how you quantify something out of the time series data, you could make it look more or less similar to the self-report, but also if you're asking someone over you know, on an average week, how many minutes do you engage in moderate physical exercise? Um, I know survey methodologists love that, but um, because it's, it's easy and it leads to a specific concrete number, but how people actually get to that is probably critically flawed. So the NHANES physical activity questionnaire has traditionally been an interviewer administered questionnaire, and it's not a global questionnaire. Okay. Um, they ask about physical activity in several different domains, transportation. Um, I think they ask some stuff about the household. They also ask, though, specifically about um, you know, moderate activities they've done in the past 30 days. Mm -hmm. Describe those activities. How often do you do them on a weekly frequency? how much time, so there's a lot of probing to it. Um, and it, you know, it, it depends, you know, there's debate on comparability between the questionnaires, but the, those data are more in line with 
a lot of the other self-report data that generally show 50 to 60 percent compliance sure. to guidelines. Mm -hmm. So it's somewhere on par. It may be on the high end, though, okay. in terms of what we see. So when, you, when you're talking about proprietary, um, it's a business model. And it almost, I was wondering if, if you were to select which one you think actually is a better device, things are kind of locked in with Actograph because it's just been so widely used and had is using it. Are we getting into a VHS versus beta kind of situation? <laughs> it's not quite that robust yet of a battle, no. Yeah. Um, I would but, still but it's also a bit about why would they ever go open source to undo what might be their domination. Yeah, they won't. They won't. So, I mean, they say actually in, in some of the press releases that years ago people had asked about their filtering methods and they kind of gave a general description. They talked about the, the bandpass filter and they defined it in terms of the corner frequencies that they use. Um, they haven't given any additional information though and there's various ways you can set up a bandpass filter. Um, so, and it says right at the bottom of the press release, though, that it says no more information will disclose because uh, this is detrimental, potentially detrimental to um, our business interests or some, something along those lines. So they're, they're very clear, clear cut about it. Um, that said, I wouldn't, I would still recommend people probably buy Actigraphs. Um, the, the data is generally pretty good from it, you know, in terms of a tracking perspective. It's still a good device. Um, and it's easy to use. A lot of their programs have built in a lot more functionality so that you can get your daily summaries of data relatively easily using their programs now. Um, and there's this huge history of data and studies behind that always use the Actigraph, the most widely used physical activity monitor and re objective research. Um, so there still is that out there. Um, you know, I don't think you get, you know, if you, let's say you a grant application and you decide you're going to use the Gen Active, I don't think you'd get dinged on something like that from a methodology standpoint. There's enough data out there showing its, you know, validity or reliability. One of the questions, though, might be in special populations, there is a little bit more information available on the Actigraph than there is on the Gen Active. So that might be something you need to consider. But it's a little bit of a toss up. I don't think. We're seeing a beta versus VHS yet. Can you tell us a little bit about how you convert to their activity count for the G forces or G count? How? Yeah, how do you, what steps do you take to convert in those activity count into G, G count? So you just take the raw Gs that the device gives you, you filter the data, um, you then full wave rectify it, so you just take the absolute value of everything. You take the mean of a user specified interval, traditionally it's a, a second is kind of the traditional approach, and then you just add those values up for whatever resolution you want, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. So is it G count considered as a G force, or is it two different? So you have mean Gs over a second, you start adding it though and the interpretation becomes Mike, what's the interpretation? It's a little bit. It's getting close to an impulse yeah. kind of measure. Yeah, it's, so it's it's hard to interpret. That's why I just came up with with, <laughs> with that kind of G count. I, I don't know what we'd name it, but. Um, so isn't, it's not really G force. No, I don't think you can necessarily just, you can't just blindly interpret it that way, no. That's one of the, the downfalls of, of using these data. I mean, it's somewhat inherent in the methods that we've used. Um, it is a little bit difficult to make sense of it. But my idea was that you know, even though it is another perhaps count type metric, it would be something that we could apply to multiple different devices and get similar outputs. Uh, the idea being we can drive down costs with the WAVE project that I'm uh, working on right now. Um, Patrick Cheng's group is developing a monitor that's going to cost about 20 bucks total compared to 250, which probably has similar capabilities to these. So. If we can do large-scale deployments with devices that cost 20 bucks as compared to 250, I mean it's it's pretty simple what wins out. Yeah. And Haynes 2003-2004 used the uh, accelerometers on the waist. The most recent one they use it on the wrist. 
based on your data, uh, it shows that for the running, uh, when both the, on the wrist and the waist worn uh, accelerometers were, 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 me were used to measure activity, um, activity was not measured correctly with the wrist one. Do you think uh, uh, Americans will look less active again? I don't, so that's just the steps. The activity counts would have actually been bigger. If I, I didn't show that there, that we didn't actually do that in that study. The activity counts would actually be larger. You, you'd see um, larger magnitude associated with those. The, there's still question marks. We don't even know what they're going to release for the NHANES. Um, some people I talked to, James McLean, who works in that group, he's the one who had told me that he said six months to a year potentially. In the past, when I had mentioned this to Rick Troiano, he talked that they would simply be releasing a sum vector magnitude, so the um, square root of the sum of the square of the x, y, and z for the entire day. <laughs> so I, I don't know. And then also a wear time estimate. That's what he had said. I don't know if that's changed. The main issue is that they can't house that data. They have each one of those files is about half a gigabyte. Um, you're looking at seven, 8,000 people, I think, that they probably assess. You do the math, they, they can't house it online, basically is what they're, it's what they're saying. They're not really willing to. Um, and in the past, with the 0304 and 0506 data, both of those, the accelerometer file was larger than all of the data released for any given cycle in the past. Just the one file was. So I think I heard you right. You mentioned that um, with this NHANES data and, and, and making um, conclusions as to whether people met uh, recommendations using activity objectable or wearables, you, you wouldn't recommend that. I'm in a minority right now who are, who are we're, we're questioning it. We don't know. I mean, I, I can't say. I mean, I, I don't, the, the, the guidelines were developed, you know, from self-report data, and then all of a sudden we're using a different approach to try and assess whether or not they're compliant. So we're taking a minute of self-report and a minute of objective monitor and saying that they're equal, yet when we measure physical activity on people, that we see these dramatic differences. And I think they're, they're, some of, they're measuring different things. And that really hasn't been something that's been really thought through and argued about. Yeah? In general, how well do these devices perform in non-impact physical activity, like cycling or something like that? <laughs> um, not too well, Mike. Um, it's gotten a little bit better with, uh, you know, a, a, originally it was just unit axial devices. So with the triaxial devices, if we look at a vector magnitude, we get a little bit better idea. But yes, um, they primarily do best in ambulatory type situations where people are moving, um, walking, running. Uh, but yes, they don't have as good of applicability for those sorts of applications with cyclists. There's been some work with this at uh, University of California, San Diego. Jack and Kerr and Simon Marshall have looked at this where they put a sense cam. Have you, has anyone seen these? So these are, it's a camera that takes pictures throughout the day and it has an accelerometer and a couple other things that trigger. Um, and they were looking at perhaps trying to be able to distinguish whether or not someone's on the bike while they're, you know, because they can see it from the picture and see if they could somehow improve the estimates they get of energy expenditure using that. Um, but it is a limitation of the devices inherently, yes. So the discrepancy between the NHANES and the like what you measured, you say accelerometers, and what measured the NHANES, the real might be somewhere in between the two, right? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah? I, I, my understanding may be being wrong, but the uh, way you're describing is a system that GT1X and the GT3X Plus has a different algorithm. But when, you know, they have X and Y, Z axis actually the vector force is coming. You know, are there different algorithms to creating that, or it seems like that GT1X 
The G values? Yeah, no, no, the actually count value from X, Y, and Z. So, so the, the data I presented, I didn't go into this. Um, I didn't want to confuse anyone, but I presented all vertical or y-axis data. Oh, yeah. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you can, you know, traditionally that's all we had because we had uniaxial devices. With triaxial devices, we can compute the vector magnitude um, quite easily, and that's kind of been a common theme. It still really hasn't caught on, though, uh, despite being around for the last five years in terms of capability. So, but no, it, it's, um, that's it. I mean, it basically you calculate the counts for each axis for a given epoch, let's say a minute, and then the vector magnitude counts are then calculated subsequently. But cut up the point is currently all used by only one axis, whether you use the 3G for X or the X1. The filtering? The cut up point for their the moderate yeah. So they, they do have, the ones I used was just the y-axis here, but they do have cut points for the vector magnitude now that people can use. It hasn't really caught on though. That's all I have. Thank you everyone. <laughs>